And I can tell you, after being involved in this for several years, I am learning every day. I never stop learning. Well, I'm happy to be on here. Um, I am a physician assistant in Ohio. Um, I have worked at a number of places, but I started going to PA school in January of 2010. I went to a private university called the University of Finley. It's in kind of north central Ohio. Um, um, at that time, when I started PA school, I was almost certain that what I was going to do and what my passion was and why I wanted to go to PA school was I wanted to go into orthopedics. I really didn't think that there was any chance that I would never go into orthopedics because I've had a shoulder surgery. I really got to know an orthopedic PA that um, kind of helped with my surgery, the rehab, and all the subsequent visits. So I was on a path to get into PA school and then find the, an orthopedic job as fast as I possibly could. So throughout my clinicals, um, I did a few rotations um, that I had to, and then I had a couple electives. And one of them was obviously going to be in orthopedics. And we had a kind of like a capstone project that I was working on in orthopedics. And um, what happened was, is the, my orthopedic rotation fell through. So here I was, I have a uh, elective rotation and what I thought the last three years of my life was building up towards. And that is just kind of a, one of the many reasons that you can never uh, you can prepare so much throughout life, but sometimes you just can't um, prepare for the unforeseen. So it happens. So long story short, I graduated. I was the class president. I uh, was a member of the Honor Society Phi Kappa Phi. And I took my first um, job um, in plastic surgery. Uh, it was reconstructive plastic surgery at an academic medical center in Ohio. Um, it was the, the Ohio State University Medical Center. And um, that was a really, really great job. I felt very fortunate that I was able to have several job offers out of school. I applied to tons of jobs, way more than any of my classmates did. But I wanted to make sure that I was going to be able to get a job because I just spent these last several years, you know, paying all this money and um, putting all this effort into this, to get to this point. So I applied to several different places and I chose this one because I wanted you know, you can ask people, they'll give you varying opinions on this. But in my mind, at this stage in my career, I wanted to find a job that would teach me the most and train me the best out of school. And working at an academic center with residents and rounding with large teams and having a really good onboarding and training process was key. And looking back, now I've been a PA for almost nine years, that was one of the best decisions I ever made. And I'll kind of get back to this in a little bit. So I worked there for a while, and then there was some structuring problems. They were re they were building a new hospital, and the department didn't dissolve, but it was I had to move out temporarily. So then I I, I um, kind of went back to a person that I did with my clinical rotations, who ultimately I had to do my elective with because I was left without orthopedics, and that was an internal medicine. And this was a really great uh, part of my training process as well. I had a, a mix between both um, office-based internal medicine, but also um, the physician had a hospital service. So I got to, to round at the hospital every morning from about 7 a.m. to 9, then go to the office from 8 to noon. And sometimes I would go run over back over to the hospital. They were really close and do a quick consult or do an H&P on a patient then go back to the office and see patients. And then occasionally I would kind of go in the evenings to back to the hospital as well. But this let me get, understand the full circle of a patient. You know, we, we would see a patient in our office. They would get admitted to the hospital for, for example, a GI bleed. You see them throughout the entire, um, we see them throughout the entire hospitalization. And then I would end up write, writing their discharge summary then they would be discharged they would, a, a week or two later. Um, he, the, a week, sorry if you guys lost me there for a minute. But what I was saying was I would get to see the full continuum of the patient. Somebody who would go to the hospital, for example, like a GI bleed. I would do their H&P, their progress notes throughout the hospital, um, do their, all, all their, their consultations throughout the hospital, all the specialists that need to be involved, discharge them from the hospital, and then see them back see them back for an office visit, kind of like a hospital follow-up visit. So it was a really great experience, but it really wasn't where my passion lied. 
Hello. <laughs> Hi, Andrew. Hi there. Hi. Let me turn my camera on. I am so sorry. Hey. Oh, Hi, you're everyone. good. You're good. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> I'm actually um, near the airport. I didn't. I forgot my flight was also today to go back home to Florida, so oh. I had to find Wi-Fi. <laughs> That's Hi. a challenge. <laughs> nice to meet you. Hi, everyone. I'm sorry again that I'm a little late. Um, thank you, Andrew, for um, starting things off and talking to everyone. Um, everyone, Andrew is a dermatology PA, and he also um, started his own fi his financing company. Yeah, for PAs. Okay. Yes. For PAs, yeah. So yes. we're going to talk more about that. But um, I'm sure Andrew already discussed a little bit about himself. And so um, just to get a quick recap, Andrew, of your journey to becoming a PA. Yeah, that was kind of what I was doing. I, I kind of went through PA school and I was kind of talking through some of my jobs that I had. And okay. I was kind of leading up to where I currently am. So I was kind of in the middle of that. Okay. All right. Um, how long have you been a PA? Uh, about nine years. Oh, wow. Okay. That's a long time. Congrats. Sometimes it seems like and, it. And um, what jobs have you had? <laughs> what jobs have you had as a PA? My first one was in uh, plastic surgery, and then I did a short stint okay. um, in internal medicine, and then I spent four years in um, uh, emergency medicine, and okay. I did dermatology for three years of that part time, just doing skin cancer oh. surgery. And then I transitioned into full-time okay. dermatology about a year ago. Okay. So what made you um, go from part-time to full-time in dermatology? Well, as I was mentioning earlier, my first job was in the, at an academic medical center and reconstructive plastic surgery. And so that okay. had to be let go for a number of reasons. So I kind of always get back into surgery and procedures of what we did with nature, like skin cancer reconstruction and all that. Like that, so I always want to get back into that. So, but getting a job at right, right, right. <laughs> so it, it took me honestly several years just to to get in the right position where they had a need, and and I was it was a time in my life where I could kind of get into that position as well. So it was just really timing and just putting putting in the effort to to get that role. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Cause, um, people actually think dermatology is really easy. I know for sure. Like what, when I was in PA school, people thought, you know, the derm test was so easy and that, you know, all it is is skin and identifying different skin conditions, but it's actually really hard. At least to me, it was, it's not like a, an yeah. easy specialty. People definitely I would agree. It. And the re so it used to be a subspecialty of internal medicine. Actually, you could go to okay. in as an internal med medicine doctor and then go into dermatology, but it has such uh, the, you know the medical terminology and dermatology is almost so unique compared to every other one that they it's it's its own specialty, and I can tell you after being involved in this for several years, I am learning every day. I never stop learning, and there is rare you know, skin conditions that you would never fathom that are actually quite serious that you would never learn about. So I, I really, really, really love. It. Okay. Wow. Nice. So, um. Can you, before we go into like some of those skin conditions, can you tell yeah. us like a day in the life of a dermatology PA? Sure. Well, the, one of the great things about being in Durham is you have pretty good hours. As I was mentioning earlier, I've worked nights and weekends and calls and overnights. And, you know, and that's, I think, a, a good part of becoming who, um, what kind of PA I am today. But normally I start my day around 7.30. I get there, my first patient is 7.45. So I kind of get in there and uh, get settled. I look at the first few patients that I have, and especially if somebody's had some complicated problems going on, or still not have a properly diagnosed treatment yet. And also, there's some, there's, you know, the, the the paperwork that comes with practicing medicine. You know, if it was all seeing patients, it'd be great, but there's so much behind the scenes yeah. paperwork. So I'll see patients around 7:45 to noon, and our practice is a is a, is a big time surgical dermatology practice. We don't do any cosmetics. It is strictly medical and surgical dermatology. Okay. So my tip is 50% of what I do is surgical and 50% of what I do is medical. So when I say medical, I mean active, rosacea, hair loss, rashes, you name it. And then there's a whole separate side, which is the surgical side, where I only do you know, 
biopsy proven skin cancer removals, I remove optimal molds that would be suspicious or even like a melanoma or a melanoma tied to like a really early stage melanoma and do I'll do the excision and then a, a closure for that. So usually each day is dedicated to like just seeing medical patients and then other days are, are designated just doing surgeries. So it's, it's a very nice mix. Okay. All right. Nice. So, um, so you have a specific day for surgery. Yep. Yep. Like okay. two full days. Mm -hmm. Okay. What's the most common surgery that you see or um, skin cancer that you see? It would be basal cell skin cancer or squamous cell skin cancer. Those are the ones that are the most common uh, in general, but not as life threatening or invasive mm -hmm. as melanoma is. Uh, and you know, a lot of them come from sun damage. So I, as you know, as you know, right. being in Florida, a lot of people are out in the sun a lot and all over the U S and a large patient, a large, uh, amount of our patient population is, is the elderly who have had a long-term exposure to the sun over time. Right. 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 Okay. And, um, so what other um, conditions do you see or common conditions that you see besides of course, cancer and your non-surgical days? Well, <laughs> I would, I'll kind of probably say, Say a rash. A rash can be something as simple as poison ivy to uh, contact dermatitis that somebody's gotten in contact with a fragrance or a uh, an additive to their clothing or in their home that gives them a bad rash. To other more serious ones, um, there, there's there's um, some skin conditions that are actually cancerous. Um, I've seen that leukemia can be in the skin. There's something called mycosis fungoides, which is a lymphoma of the skin. And there's a lot of other inflammatory skin diseases that we see, such as psoriasis, uh, or a lot of other um, blistering disorders that come with a lot of follow-up and steroid injections and, and re-evaluations of their, their treatment plan. And somebody just asked me the question, are you doing surgery or with a physician? At this point in my career, it is me and a nurse in the room. I do the the cleansing, the marking, the the numbing it with. We use lidocaine with epinephrine. I do the the uh, excision and the removal of the skin cancer. And then a lot of times, what we do is we use electric electric cautery, which is a, a, basically a bovi that burns the tissue to stop the bleeding. And then usually a layered closure with deep sutures that um, uh, you know d dissolve over time. And then also some superficial sutures need to come out at a later time. So it's real, you know, I would say that's a few years into doing procedures and surgeries that you, you would have to have that. Otherwise, um, you know, it, it takes it takes a lot of time and there is so much to learn. And in fact, I'm learning every day about how to close the tissue. It's, you know, it's more than just closing it in a straight line. Um, there's so much more about cur curving and tapering the wound edges. A lot of times I do what's called a Y-plasty where you basically, the incision looks like a Y at the end. Um, and, and curving it as well. I do some kind of. I do some only minor tissue rearrangement. The, the, the physician I work with does a lot of um, nose surgery. And they does. He does a lot of. Okay, I'm sorry. My connection went out for a second. Can you hear That's me okay. fine? Yeah, I can. Okay. All right. I'm so sorry. Okay. Um, what you were talking about your the common procedures that you see? Yeah, yeah. Somebody okay. asked, like, do I do them alone or with a physician? I was saying at this point in my career, I do them alone. Okay, all right. And um, so, can you um, quick, really quick, before we go into the case studies, talk about your um, PA for finance, how you started that, and what made you start that? Oh, sure. So. <laughs> Um, throughout this whole process, I, I, I developed a passion for um, how, how to manage my own personal finances regarding my school loans. How do I save? How do I invest? And I met a, really, a lot of really smart people in the last 10 years of my life. And I found that I, I wanted to learn more. And then I found that I wanted to actually help others um, with their situation because I've, I had no business training, no finance training. My, my plan to pay off PA school loans was over a 25 year period when I graduated. <laughs> then I realized that that really wasn't, um, over time, I realized that really wasn't what I wanted. That, but developing that plan to do that, and you know, then you then you deal with taxes, and some people are, are contracted employees, or a very complicated situation. So I wanted to learn more, so I went back to school, 
throughout during this time and graduated with an MBA in healthcare management and got that just about seven or eight months ago. So I started a company that's a PA for finance and basically we work only with physician assistants and help them with a variety of financial solutions. And I really love that. that that's kind of okay. becoming my new passion as well. <laughs> oh, nice. So wait, did you get your MBA before or after PA school? You went back to get it or? After I just graduated with it in uh, April of this year. Oh, nice. So how were you able to do that and work? Were you working part-time or how were you able to juggle it going back to school? Well, I did an accelerator program because I just wanted to get it done with. And it was, it was time management is key. Just like when you're a pre-PA, just like when you're in a PA school, you have to manage your time. You know, um, I would just set dedicated okay. in the morning or at night or on the weekends. And uh, so I had to, had to use that. It was, it was all online. It made it really flexible. I didn't have to actually go to a classroom. But I was working full time. So do you, um, what kind of clients do you help? I know it's PAs, but do you tend to see like more new grads or those that are more seasoned? You know, I would say overall, it's probably people that are newer into their job because they have all these student loans that they really never planned to manage. But I will tell you, I have a lot of people that are experienced and have a lot of complicated, you know, scenarios with their job, their families. Um, being furloughed is, is a major problem recently with COVID-19 and just kind of helping them create, you know, financial decision making that's going to make them be in a better spot one day. And, you know, change happens slow. But so a lot of them with that. But I actually have a, a webinar that's through it's through AAPA This we're going to be hosting on December 17th, which is dedicated to pre-PAs, which just to kind of help people understand how to start their career off on the right note, even before you go to PA school, because believe it or not, there's a lot of things you can do before going to PA school that will help you in the long run. Okay. What's the name of the webinar? And actually your con um, contact information. So we can also put it. In well, the, it's uh, going to be, it's going to be, so it's, it's going to be, um, APA is going to launch the, um, the sign up for it on December 1st. And it's, it's pre PA's, Path to Financial Health is the name of the webinar, and um, my business the the P it's called it's, it's P A for Finance, so it's P A dash four the number four and then finance, and it's so the website is www.paforfinance.org. Okay, so I actually see some people had some questions. They sure. said someone said, um, "What do you say doing a residency in surgery is beneficial, or do you think learning through the years on the job is enough?" It depends where you want to start. That's because, you know, some people are ready. Maybe they've had, you know, some of their healthcare experience hours were, you know, in surgery. Some people were like, for example, before PA school for two and a half years, I worked in surgery as a patient care assistant was, was the term. I, I actually was in and out of the operating room. Sometimes I actually got a hold of tractors and a first assist if they needed help. So that was really helpful for me even before I went into PA school. So I think it really depends on your experience and your comfort level, but also finding if, if you want the experience, I think you will be very well trained. You're never wrong to do a residency because I feel, especially if you do that at a very reputable institute, but getting that experience is key. But I, but 10 years ago, residencies weren't common for me and, and they just had a really great onboarding with very experienced PAs that just kind of, it was essentially a residency. They didn't call it that, that then, but it's what it was. So if it, I, the hard thing to answer is because you never know what situation you're going to walk into because some people just want a PA to, to work, 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 and they don't want to train them. And you, you need that training beyond school. But if you work for a big, you know, a big center or a big you know institute, they have mechanisms and steps in place to train you. So um, I would say, long story short, it really varies on your comfort level. And um, what do you recommend as far as pre-PA students, um, their financial plan for going to PA school? Well, in general, um, Take out, you have to get a plan as far as, are you going to work? You have a, this is kind of a complicated discussion, but do you have a, do you have a partner? Are you alone? How much are your school loans before you go to PA school? Do you plan on going straight in from undergraduate straight into PA school? Um, 
you know, there's some people want to take a few years off and pay off their student, their, their undergrad loans and just take out the other loans for that or to save up enough money to live on through PA school and not have to take out those additional loans. And some people are very fortunate enough that they have people that help them financially. Um, but it's, it's, I have a, it's, that's kind of a long discussion, but really it's just getting a plan. And it, and honestly, it doesn't have to be one set plan for you. If you have, you know, 80,000 undergrad loans or 150,000 of undergraduate loans, or 20,000 of undergraduate, it really just depends on your situation. But what, what I'll, one of the things I'll be doing during my, my talk through uh, AAPA is, and I was guilty of this too, uh, I'll, I'll, I will be honest, is when you apply for your loans, you get extra loans and you kind of get like the refund at the end. And I, I never forget that refund used to be like $3,500 or something. And I can't tell you how many clients that I've had that taken a trip for it. Or they went, or they bought, you know, put it as a down payment on your car, but that is a loan that is a very high interest loan, and, and that is that is just one thing to not do, um, and just tell yourself before that that you can put that away and just use that to put on your loans afterwards if you get some extra money. But that that refund for uh, either undergrad or or PA school, that is not for play, <laughs> as much as you want it to be. <laughs> <laughs> that is very, very true. I mean, yeah, even undergrad, um, we got certain grants, undergrad and scholarships. When you get that money back, mm -hmm. a lot of us, you know, being young minded, we just quickly go and spend it and spend it frivol frivolously. But you're very right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you live and you learn, you know. <laughs> right. right. So um, I know there's more questions, but I want to save some of those for the end if we have time. And um, sure. if we don't, if we don't have time to finish answering some questions, um, would you mind um, providing some of your contact information, especially for those that are yeah. interested in the PA for finance and have questions for you about dermatology? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, and what do you, contact information do you want me to write in the comments? Um, I can write it. How can they reach can you? Okay, me. sure. Okay, yeah. sure. So in the meantime, guys, we're going to um, get ready to do some case studies. We're going to hopefully um, knock out two case studies. Uh, if anybody wants to join in to answer, to walk through the case studies, just raise your hand like usual, and we'll go through the case studies. And we'll have you go through them with Andrew. All right. Hi, Rafi. Hi. Hello. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. Thank you for tuning in. Okay, so I'm just going to have um, you and Andrew talk through a case study together. Okay. Okay, great. All right, so we have a 50-year-old Caucasian female who comes in because her son says she has a changing mole on her back. Okay. So for a living, um, she does works in an office. Um, but she does enjoy vacationing. In fact, her and her family go on several vacations a year, and it's usually in the southern uh, part of the U.S. where they, she does a lot of laying out and sunbathing and swimming and just a lot of outdoor activities. She also has a pool at her house that she uses, and she lays out there a lot as well. Um, her kids have lots of friends, and she tells me she needs to be out there with them frequently to supervise their activities and make sure everyone is safe. And she's also used a tanning bed off and on throughout her life. She says not within the last few years, but there was a few years of her life where she would use it 20 to 30 times per year, usually in the winter months to stay tan. So when somebody comes in for a changing mole, they give me a piece of paper and I look at all that acti all, all those, you know, we have certain questions we ask. Um, and so I, when I see that immediately, I think to myself, well, this person's got of sun exposure at 50 years of age and then so that's just the um that's just like their their written history and then you look at the patient and you know it's november right now should this patient have a a tan in ohio and the answer is easy no they should not yeah. <laughs> um so i see this person it has has very tan skin and has a lot of uh, wrinkle age uh, wrinkles in, her, in their face it tells me they've been outside a lot so having that situation, I already know before I even do any physical exam that this patient has had a lot of sun exposure at her life, much more than she should have. So she tells me that um, I've had this mole on my back for years, but my son says it's gotten bigger and that him and his friends, they joke about it and they poke at it as well. So 
Um, I have her lift up the back of her shirt and I very quickly am able to isolate this brown pigmented spot. And when we look at moles on a patient, um, we, we think we, there's a few things we look at. The size is how big is it? You know, if it's the size of a quarter, it sticks out easier than if it's the size of like a, a pencil tip. So I look at the size and then we look at the borders of it. Does it look like an, does it look like round like a coin or does it look like the state of Hawaii? Is it, you know, is it irregular looking? Next thing is the color. If it's nice and brown, uh, the same color all throughout, then that's in general okay. okay. But this one has speckles on it. It has areas of black and also has some areas of white in the center of it as well. So it's multicolored. And then it's big. If it's, if it's bigger than six millimeters, that indicates that you need to pay special attention to it. So this is, this is 1.7 millimeters. So it's about three times the size it should be. So would you take a biopsy? Yes. Um, so we call this the ABCD rule. Is it, uh, the last thing is, does it have asymmetry? I mean, is it a circle or is it asymmetric? So if it's asymmetric, the borders are irregular, the color is irregular, and the diameter is regular, then absolutely. We should probably get a closer look at this. So before I would do anything else with that, I would definitely do a head-to-toe exam on the patient. And that means um, getting down to only their, their bra or underwear um, with a gown on. And I always have a, a chaperone for everybody that I do because you have to kind of look in some, some places where the sun doesn't shine because believe it or not, those are areas that people can get skin cancer. So you kind of got to look everywhere. So I'll do that just to make sure there's nothing else I'm missing or there's any other spots before I, I would isolate down on this one lesion. So I would do what's called a punch biopsy. There is um, three ways to do a biopsy, a shave where you basically just, for all these, you have to use numbing medicine to numb the skin. We use lidocaine with epinephrine. You shave off a little piece of it, that, but we don't want that for this one. If there's a pigmented mole, you never want to shave it deeply or superficially. You have to get through all the layers of the skin. So a punch biopsy is another option. And that is basically when you core out a whole piece and then you snip it off at the bottom so you get all the layers of the tissue. So that would be the first question. Do you do a punch biopsy for this or not? And the answer at being 1.7 centimeters, excuse me, 1.7 yeah, centimeters is no you want to do what's called an excisional biopsy. If we are worried or concerned that this is a possible melanoma, we want we do not want to disrupt this architecture of this and possibly spread it out further into the surrounding tissue. So we're going to take an excisional biopsy, which means we are going to take a few millimeters extra all the way around this to make sure that there is no more of this possible melanoma left over. Okay. So, th so that's basically um, what I would, that's a very common thing I deal with is doing skin exams and in dermatology, you know, in PA school, you'll learn this, but in dermatology, particularly what's the most common thing that you're looking at and what is the thing you can't miss? So what's most common to this, this could just be a weird looking mole. It's very possible and it happens all the time, but what you can't miss is melanoma. And for this mm -hmm. case, on that day, I would, I, would, I would schedule her over my lunch period or after hours to make sure we got that excisional biopsy and removed all that, um, that tissue. So if you saw on any other part of her, her body, would you do the same thing? But it depends. Yes, but it depends on the size. You know, so many times these are like three or four millimeters in size. And then you can do like a six millimeter punch biopsy. You want to pick a punch biopsy that's going to make sure you get all of it. You don't want to just, you know, it might not be big enough to get it all. Then, then that's when you do an excisional biopsy. So it's very common that I would remove, do an excisional biopsy, which is actually a small surgery on one spot, and then do a couple other punch biopsies on other moles that also look suspicious. Okay. All right. Good job, Rafi. Um, do you have any other questions for Andrew? No. Thank you for doing this. It's really interesting. I never thought of dermatology before, but now it's like you... You think about it in a different way, which is nice. Thank you. Well, I'm glad you came on. It was nice chatting with you. Thanks. I see the Dr. Pimple Popper comments on there. I get asked 
every single day if I watch that show and I've watched it for just a few minutes only. Um, I, I've only seen abscesses and cysts. I've never seen any moles. So <laughs> I've actually never watched it. I think I've seen a few of the um, videos on Instagram, but mm -hmm. like them, it, it's kind of gross. But, <laughs> but I've actually never seen the actual show. I didn't know there was a show. There is. And I'll tell you, I remove cysts several times a week. And usually you want to keep the cyst intact and just remove the whole cystic sac in one and not, not pop it and, and risk rupturing it and having it basically uh, seep into the surrounding tissue. You, you want to remove the whole thing, but I, I get why they do it. It, it is, it is fun to watch. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do you do a lot of abscesses like INDs? I mean, I know they do that. I work in the ER. I know it comes a lot in the ER, but is that just more of a surgery thing or? Oh, no, I, I, we do abscesses a lot. And a lot of times what happens if I get a new patient or an existing patient that comes in and they have a really like inflamed, infected abscess, I'll IND it and do an incision and drain it. So you cut it open and squeeze it out. I'll put them on antibiotics and have them come back in in about three to four weeks. And then we'll do the complete excision of it. Okay, nice. Okay, so we're going to run through our next case study. Okay, and um, what's your name? I can't see your name. What's your name? Juliana. Okay, Juliana. Yeah, Juliana with Juliana. Okay, so I'm going to let you Hi, and um, Andrew take over. Okay, how are you tonight? I'm good. How are you? Great. Okay, so this one is a 35-year-old male who comes in for hair loss for two weeks. So this guy is a college professor who also um, coaches baseball. Um, he, wears a, he wears a ball cap a lot, and he wears a helmet a lot to help his, his, um, the people on the team get better and you know just shows them some general techniques. And he noticed about two weeks ago um, when he was scratching his head that he felt an area that just didn't seem the same, but he didn't think much of it. A couple of days later, he went in and got a haircut, and his barber said, huh, I never, we've known each other for years. I've never seen this, but you actually are losing a small patch of your hair. But even at this point in time, it's been about five to seven days. He's busy. He has a kid. He's a teacher. He's a coach. He said, you know what? I'm just going to deal with it and keep moving on. Well, it got worse. It got worse to the point where he felt he was completely bald in the size about a, of a, a, a silver dollar. So, you know, about that big in his head, which became significant. And in dermatology, this happens all the time. This time, it wasn't uh, the last patient. It was her son that made them come. This time, it was his wife that made him come. She said, you know, you better go get that checked. So he comes in for a hair loss. And at this point in time, he's also starting to get a little bit self-conscious of it. Um, he's, when he, as soon as he can, he puts on his hat at all times because it's starting to bother him. And so we saw him, and we started going through his history and really, this person seems very normal. He's on no medicines. He hasn't had any infections recently. Really, everything was completely normal, seemingly, about this patient. And it also, um, it didn't itch. It didn't burn. He didn't know. If he if his wife wouldn't have told me he was there, he probably wouldn't even paid close attention to it. So, um, did you know there is a few different kinds of hair loss? No. A lot of times we think of just the classic, you know, male pattern baldness where right. you, you, your temporal hairline and the vertex of the scalp starts thinning. And that is something every, every person has seen here. Um, but this is not that. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. So he comes in and when you work in dermatology, you deal with the skin, but you also deal with the hair and the fingernails and the toenails. Those are things we, we deal with every day. And so this person had a condition and what you had to do is you have to look at the hair, the head very closely because what people do sometimes is even though they don't realize it, they'll pull their hair out. People um, with a lot of anxiety and a lot of stress going on through life, especially mm -hmm. during the pandemic, we see lots of skin conditions that are manifested by increase of stress. So you really have to consider that as well. 
to make sure that he wasn't actually pulling out his hair or picking it off. Mm -hmm. But after a thorough inspection, he was not, you could see there was no, there was no scratch to the scalp. There's no, um, you can, there's no irritation up there. So he had a condition called alopecia areata. And that is basically when you lose your hair for an unknown reason, there is some reasons of it, but basically it just, it just falls out and it's in an isolated spot and there's really nothing you can do about it, but it can be very disruptive to someone's life. It can be very scary. You know, when you hear a seemingly 35 year old patient come in and say, I've never been to a doctor in my life or a PA or a, a provider in my life, but my hair's falling out. It really means something um, when, when they do that. And it, and it happens very commonly in females as well. Um, so there's, there's some treatments from that that we won't really get into uh, at this point in time, but um, it is a really common problem. But the, the good thing about it is when something like this happens, it's usually not serious or life-threatening. Now, if you start losing your hair all throughout your body, um, that can happen a lot of times when people have major weight loss. People lose a lot of weight. Um, do you have any questions about, about hair loss in general, not just this, this kind of hair loss in general? Um, do you ever do like blood work in terms of like looking at like vitamin levels and other things like in the body to like, we're all like that isn't causing any hair loss? That is a wonderful question. The answer is yes. In fact, I did do it on this guy because it was such a prominent area and it happened so quickly. Sometimes it can be, um, the size of me, the size of like a, a penny, for example, but th this was much, much larger than that. So Yes, you want to make sure there's no metabolic problem. So that is a really great question. And a very common um, level that's out of range for this is your thyroid level. Mm -hmm. Some people have hypothyroidism or even high, high thyroid levels, and that can cause um, hair loss. So that's a really great point. So is you said alopecia doesn't really have a, a cause, well, typically doesn't have a cause? So alopecia is a term for general hair loss. Okay. But it's it's subdivided into into different ones. So that so um, so male pattern baldness is one kind, and that that's basically genetic. Mm -hmm. um, that is something that's in your genes, and sometimes women actually have a lot of thinning hair as well on the top of their head, and that and that can be genetic. Um, it can be it can be worse when people put their hair up a lot. One of the things we see when people braid their hair a lot. It's called traction alopecia, where basically the the increased pulling and traction of their hair. A lot of times it's around this area right here or up in here when they pull their hair up. Um, it will cause so much stress on the scalp that their hair will fall out. And that's a really difficult thing to manage because a lot of it's young, young people that have this happen to them. So that's essentially a cause of that. Um, but, th but this kind, the good thing is usually in one to three months, it goes away on its own. Do you typically see um, women or men who a lot have a lot of done stuff done to their hair um, come in with hair loss? Like if they have like color done to their hair or like typically use like heat on it a lot. Do you see that kind of more common? I, I do see that. Loss? Yes. So um, a lot is maybe not necessarily as much the hair. So when somebody gets their hair dyed, what usually happens is they get scalp dermatitis. So their scalp gets a red itchy, sometimes burning, stinging rash on it. And it's from the hair dye that was used. A lot of time heat can do the same. Um, as I mentioned, braiding of the hair can do the same as well. But some people, you can have somebody that's done it their whole life and never have one issue with it. Or you can have somebody who does it one time and has a severe reaction or severe problem to it. It's just, yeah, everyone's different. Thank Any you. other questions? No, that's it. Thank you. Well, you're on the right track. Keep it up. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much, Juliana. Yeah, great. That was great. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew, for that. Yeah. Let's see. We have about eight minutes left. Um, well, people actually have some questions about hair loss. It said, um, one question is, does dandruff play a role in hair loss? Not usually. The um, the term that we use for hair loss, excuse me, um, dandruff is what we call as seborrhea of the scalp, which is flaking and scaling of the scalp. And the big thing you do not want to do is pick it. And you want to do um, gentle shampoos. Harsh shampoos can really magnify that as well. If that doesn't get better, we treat with a specialized um, actually antifungal shampoo 
And sometimes we also give some, some uh, very low potency steroid lotion to rub into your scalp because it's just, it's just irritated. And a lot of times it's from picking it and shampoos. I know I probably won't make a lot of friends over on this saying this, but if you use Bath and Body or Axe, not not a good idea. I, I, I see issues with that every single day. <laughs> wow, really? Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, smells good, but it's not easy on the yeah, skin. Yeah, <laughs> chemicals. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, does picking, scratching, at it increase the amount of dandruff? Yes, it does. You're 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 irritating and, and causing more inflammation of the scalp and it's a natural reaction the more irritation it has the more it tries to flake off and would you do plate enriched plasma treatment for hair loss we we do not get into that at our office usually those are like uh, hair transplant centers or people that specialize in hair loss so we, we do not do that as much i know it exists and i know it happens all the time but in general we refer those patients out Okay, thank you. Okay, we have five minutes left, and I actually really quick wanted to touch on life-threatening dermatologic conditions. Mm -hmm. um, I know Steven Johnson syndrome is one, and that's a big yeah. one. So can you talk about some life-threatening ones? I know cancer, of course, melanoma, but what can pa patients die from? Um, what skin conditions can patients die from that yeah, we should always know and remember? So uh, there's if anyone on this has ever had the medicine Bactrim, which is a sulfur-based medicine, or um, a lot of people who have inflammatory bowel disease will be on sulfur-based medicines. You can get, um, as she was saying, something called Steven Johnson syndrome, where your skin literally melts off. It is people that get that have to be placed in an intensive care unit in a, in a uh, burn unit because your skin, it's essentially, it's, it's falling off and melting off. I've seen it one time when I actually when I worked in the ER on a young patient who came in with a, a fever of like 104 degrees and his skin was, was truly sloughing off. So that, that's one. Were they on Bactrim? They were on sulfasalazine for the ulcerative colitis. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Very scary. Wow. And that's, that's the only time you've ever seen it? seen that that condition yes yeah. i've read about it a wow. lot in case okay. studies but i've never that was the one time i saw it yeah i've never actually seen it thank god but yeah i've seen the pictures of course and read case studies but yeah, yeah. so some other things were i had a, a as you can get leukemia of the skin i had a patient come in who had these fast growing nodulars nodules all you know about that big they were coming all over her back and her abdomen they didn't bother her and in fact, I didn't know what it was. And it was great that my supervising physician was available and I brought him into the room and he saw the patient and he didn't know what it was initially, 100%. So we had to biopsy it, but he did know that it was something that was very serious. And ultimately it was, she had some very rare bone marrow disorder that caused something called leukemia cutis of the skin. And um, she's not doing well at the time, unfortunately. So that's another one. Wow. Wow. I've there's, never heard of that one. one. Yeah, there's another one called, I mentioned it earlier, it's called uh, mycosis fungoides. We call it MF from the name. Um, but it is lymphoma of the skin. It is a distinctive rash that um, is actually lymphoma of the skin. And we treat it with a lot of light therapy. And we also treat it with a medication. It's a nitrogen mustard medication. It's very, very old, but it works well to, to treat that medicine. So that's another one as well. Okay. And someone asked about necrotizing fasciitis. Have you ever seen mm -hmm. or treated that? I've been involved with that many times. Um, not as much in the outpatient clinic as I have been in the hospital. When I worked at the, the, the plastic surgery at the, at, at the academic center, we saw it all the time. And in fact, that's the first time I ever used a, a bovite, which is a burns the skin in surgery when I was a student. A patient had um, diabetes and they got it on their abdomen and it was essentially removing more and more tissue of their abdomen until it got into their vital organs. And it's a very, very scary thing. You, you have to treat that early on with triple um, IV antibiotics, three different antibiotics IV quickly. And the hard part is if somebody comes in with a little scratch on their finger, like, uh, you know, just let it sit for a few days, maybe put some triple antibiotic ointment or whatever you use or some oral antibiotics and then 
two, two days later, they come in their hands about to fall off. It, it's very, very scary. And it does exist. I've seen it many times. Wow. Yeah. And I know the survival rate is very, very low. Like you can die yeah, within a few scary. days from um, necrotizing fasciitis. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. So um, let me see if any other, there's a lot more questions. Guys, um, may not have time to answer all your questions, but you can always email Andrew. It's andrew at paforfinance.com. Um, someone I asked, mentioned about psoriasis, psoriasis which is a very, yeah. very, that's something I deal with every single day. Um, a lot of times we get new patients who come in who they're on a very small patch or it's more widespread. And depending on if it's in a one uh, isolated area or if it's widespread, really depends on the treatment. Ideally, uh, you get they need to have some sort of light therapy. We use topical steroids. Vitamin D um, is another thing we mix a lot with our um, creams that we use for it. But ultimately, if somebody has very severe psoriasis, we have to go to one of the biologic medications that you see like advertised on TV, like Humira is one. Um, there's a lot, there's Cosentix, there's Trimphia, um, or Tesla. And a lot of these are uh, weekly, biweekly or monthly injections. And they have really, really great improvement for psoriasis. But the problem is, is, is they do weaken your immune system. And right now with the pandemic going on, that's been a big concern for a lot of patients. So they've stopped it on their own or just asked to be transitioned to something else for fear of getting sick. So it's been really challenging for psoriasis patients recently. Okay. Wow. Okay. Um, and someone has said, hey there. how do you treat a patient when you accidentally made their condition worse or start a new skin issue? Well, let's see. You definitely try not to do that. I mean, sometimes a, a medicine... For example, if somebody has a fungus on their skin, they have yeast on their skin, and you think it could be they were allergic to, you know, laundry detergent. So you give them a steroid. The steroid would actually make the fungus worse. And at that point in time, usually the patients are understanding because um, you kind of tell them this is what it looks like. You know, we can treat you with this and this should get better, but there's a chance it may get worse. And if it does get worse and you just call us and let us know or come back in and we'll reevaluate it. Um, certainly everything we do every day, I do every day is make sure I'm not going to cause harm for a patient. So when, when you're going through these medicines or these treatments, you always have to inform the patient about the side effects and what could happen. You know, all medicines have side effects, even Tylenol. So they just have to stay informed exactly. and, and know if something comes up, just let you know immediately. Exactly. Okay. So, um, eight o'clock and usually I'll stay a little later, but I'm sorry, guys have to go home for the holidays, but I'll stay in the chat and um, answer questions, of course. But I just, one last thing, Andrew, any takeaways, things that they should know or remember anything that you want to um, touch bases on before we go? I would say, I kind of mentioned it earlier. Dermatology is such a broad field. Think to yourself, whenever you see a skin condition, what's the most common option here and what can't I miss? If you abide by those rules, um, you, you always got to think about the worst when you form a differential diagnosis. And also, never you can always ask for help. We're all learning. I'm still learning every single day. Uh, it, you need to make sure when you when you uh, if you whenever you get into practice, you form a relationship with your supervising physician where you two can talk to each other and ask them questions and you'll find later they'll ask you questions too but you have to you have to get a good relationship early on otherwise it can put you in some very difficult um scary situations yes yes and that's true for all specialties all specialties absolutely but, absolutely yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you thank you so much andrew especially for coming on um when i wouldn't wasn't able to earlier Thank you for leading no the way um, the past the first 15 minutes. And sorry, guys, again, for the technical difficulties. Um, it's the holiday season, but thank you so much, Andrew. They really enjoyed it. I see thank so you. many praises in the comments. Thank you. Um, Once again, you guys, um, feel free to reach him at his email, andrew at paforfinance.com. And, yeah, he's here to um, answer any questions you guys may have, both related to dermatology absolutely. and um, PA for Finance. All right. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. This you. was a great time. I hope we can do it again sometime. 
Thank you. Yeah, definitely. And I'll be home next time. All right, you, <laughs> I will safe, be near the airport. <laughs> safe travels and happy holidays to you. Thank you. Thank you. Happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Good night.